Hello, Alex here again with another run through of some of my recently processed images. It's another mixed up selection this month. There's 25 pictures to have a quick look at. And these are just pictures that I've processed for various reasons over the last few weeks. Um, I'm actually shortly off to Vancouver Island in Canada, which I'm very much looking forward to because I, it's a destination I've not visited now for more than a decade. Um, and as such, I'm sort of very excited to get back and see that amazing underwater place. Um, and actually, the first few pictures come from there. So this month or this week, we've got pictures from Canada. We've got pictures from the Red Sea and pictures from the UK. The Red Sea and the UK pictures are all recent ones taken this summer. And then the few that's kicked this off, which are on screen at the moment, there's a couple of, are from Canada. And they're ones actually that usually in the run up to a trip, I like to return and have a look through those old folders of images not just the favorites that I chose to process at the time but actually go back to all the pictures I, I chose to keep from those trips and have a look at those because those will give me ideas of, of subject matter of shots that maybe I was trying to get last time but didn't quite get and could do a better job of now and also it stops me repeating myself too much by going back and just shooting the same images that I shot on a previous visit and so and in that process of that, I, I spotted a few images that I wanted to process out because I thought they might be useful either for me as stock images or to use in the presentations during the workshop. So those first few images from Canada are that and it starts off with this decorated war bonnet, which you can see on the left of the screen here. Let's just blow him up and see him full screen. Um, there he is. Um, and this actually, this photo here was taken with the Nikon D3 um, camera, which is I use for this particular trip. Um, and I must have used the teleconverter, no, I must use the Sigma 150 on this because it's shot with a 150mm lens, which is an interesting choice. And um, it's actually been the, the Nikon D3 was a 12 megapixel camera, but I, I reprocessed these using super resolution on Lightroom. And you can see how you know sharp the pictures are. There's just zoomed in on the eye. You know, that's lovely and sharp. That's now a you know, 50 or 48 megapixel file from a 12 megapixel original. And that's the sharpness and detail and color at, at 100%. And OK, the D3 is not quite up to, I think, the highlight areas here. are just, you know, there's a little lack of detail compared to a modern camera. But that's pretty impressive for, a, you know, a photo that's, you know, digital photo that's 14, 15 years old now. Um, and that technology is, you know, none of us would ever pick up a D3 as a serious camera anymore um but it shows actually you know it's incredibly capable of producing you know images that are still in really really usable anyway um, the next picture is a grunt skull pin um and another one processed at super resolution lovely sharp detail there on the eye of the grunty um you can see his little horns there on his nose um another really cool characteristic species of that area a uh, a pen point gunnel um, we call them butterfish in the UK. They're not the same species, but they're they're clearly very closely related, as quite a few of the species are. I mean, the the war bonnet we saw the first picture. It looks very like the our uh, Yarrells Blenny in in the UK, but just pumped up and turned up to eleven really. Um, and I think there are species of of this type of of of, of fish right across that 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 the sort of the northern seas. I know in in Japan they have some very cool looking ones as well and in the the northern seas around the around the the top of, of russia and things like that they have similar um fish right this next one the green one here this is the mouth of a green surf anemone one of the shallow water anemone species probably just a, a, a snap taken off at the end of a dive on a safety stop and then a detailed shot of the gills of a starfish of a of a, a celestia a sun star and you can, if i zoom in here you can see all the gill detail of all the these little um um, hydrostatically inflated gills coming out of the starfish and then some of the giant plumos and enemies um, just growing there's a pair of them here um, growing up as a V formation underneath the kelp right, they're just a few pictures that I hadn't I chose not to process at the time oh there's one more from Canada these are pictures I chose not to process back when I took took them but um, seeing them now I thought I might as well process them out this is a a very classic shot from that area a picture of a red Irish Lord's eye and the red Irish Lords they have this this lovely sparkly pattern across the the, the, the top of their their eye um, going right across the the iris of the eye um, and I think it's yeah really 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 pretty 
and I've photographed it many times and have lots of pictures of it. And I think that's probably why I never processed this picture at the time because I had other shots um, which are very similar. But actually, I realised that most of the other shots I had are all verticals. So I thought it was worth having a, although this is not quite as nice as some of those other shots, it was worth just processing one out to have a horizontal of it. Right, and now bang up to date with some um, a few more pictures from my Red Sea trips. I've shown um, quite a few of these before, so you, you'll see them. Uh, one thing I didn't say is, uh, obviously I have the screen set up like this on these recordings, so you can read the camera settings on the right if you're watching this at, at full resolution. Um, you can see here, um, this was shot with a well, it was a Nikon D850 with the 8-15mm lens, ISO 320, 1 100th second F13. All these pictures are also now on my website, so if you search on my website using the subjects in the pictures or the destinations in the pictures, you'll be able to find them on my website and, and on my website be able to read the camera settings off them as well. So um, if, I, if I don't mention them or, or don't highlight them, you can see them that way. Um, these are yellow dot trevally and um, they're really they're kind of these long elongated quite large jacks um, this is an, uh, a spawning or a mating aggregation sh sh um, school um, and when they're mating a lot of the jacks the males color up with these dark colorations you can see this one here has got a nice dark coloration on him um, um, when they're in these mating schools and, and a number of jack species color up in this way when they're mating and these tend to swim around in, in schools, but clearly sort of form pairs within the schools as they're swimming around the reef. I've, you never, I've never seen them spawning, but they, they in the summertime in the Red Sea, they gather in this way. Just a, a wall of anthias. I, as, as, as anyone who follows my photography knows, knows that I'm a lover of fish and, and anthias are, are just a wonderful fish. So it's always great to photograph them. There's, there's one there sitting sitting out there. This is just a, rather than shooting them with a wide lens, probably shot with a WACP. Um, so it might say 28mm or, or whatever on the, oh, it's always zoomed in. But it, yeah, it, so although it says it's a 52mm lens, it's behind a WACP. So it's quite a bit wider than a 52mm lens. And But I, I like this sort of not too wider, sort of almost standard lens view that I think really sort of compresses the perspective and just makes this, what was a very dense aggregation of Anthias, look even more impressive. Um, but those are just a few, well, there's only two actually, um, leftover Red Sea shots that I want to process. There's still quite a lot more to process on that Red Sea trip. I just haven't had much processing time of late. Um, and then we're heading up to Scotland to the Isle of Col. This is on my, my non-basking shark, basking shark trip. Um, when I went to Scotland this summer, we didn't have any luck with basking sharks. But the area is fantastic for photography, and I always enjoy all the photography up there. Just it's a real chance to be in some beautiful water and beautiful scenery underwater, and really interesting wildlife both above and below the water. And the chance to make some pictures. This is spaghetti or thongweed growing up from from the seabed here, dominating this this shallow area. Um, and this is the same species of seaweed, but this time with with the red pom pom seaweed on it. Um, just creating this this really fascinating seaweed um, garden habitat, which is one of I, I really enjoy snorkeling in these environments and, and making pictures, trying to find different scenes. It is quite samey scenery, so I think doing it once or twice a year is probably enough. But it, I think you know you if you challenge yourself to find different compositions, different combinations of the subject matter, it can be really nice. So this is serrated rack in the foreground and then the, the thong weed or the spaghetti weed in the background. Um, and that's me um, swimming through it. Um, this is just swimming through the some of the spaghetti weed. Um, just taking a snap of me um, in the water. This is um, a little bit of whale watching that we were doing. Um, we started off quite a long way from the whales, but the the, the, the whales drove the, the bait ball of fish to our boats. And in fact, you could see that they, they, they were, this, these are um, minke whales and they, they lunge feed below the surface. So it's not as spectacular as when you get a humpback's feeding and they, they break through the surface. Um, so you, you don't normally see much apart from a splash with the minke whales, but it's still amazing to be around them. And um, they were hunting sand eels. And if I zoom in here, you might be able to see a few sand eels just spilling out the water as the um, as the minke whale comes through. And there's a sheer water swooping overhead. Um, and it looks like it's really close to the boat here, actually. But it, it was actually quite a long way away. The, the telephoto lens I was using has really compressed that perspective. Um, makes the boat look quite a bit closer 
than it was. But we were all sort of engines off and had been for quite a long time. And the whales actually, or the fish, and you know, swam towards our boats. And actually, we look, you could look over the side, and there was just, you know, swarms and swarms of sand eels racing underneath us. This is Laminaria digitata, one of the, the kelp species in the UK. You can tell it's digitata by those thin stipes, the, um, the, 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 I get the stalk for want of a better way. It's not stalk, but it's, it looks like a stalk on any other plant um, growing up and, and holding the things. This is a more shallow water species than our, our other Laminaria um, species, which is, um, they don't, the common name, everyone just calls them all kelp. They do have, this is called all weed officially. But I mean, the Latin names actually on these are much more useful. So Laminaria digitata, which is this one, digitata means hand-like, which you know because the the fronds, the the the, the blades of the the kelp look a bit like a hand. Um, and then the other one, um, which is actually in this picture here, that's convenient. Um, this is the background of this picture here is the other species of 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 kelp of Laminaria kelp we have that dominates in our waters, and this is Laminaria hyperborea, which is sometimes called guvi, but mainly just called kelp or forest kelp. And this has got much thicker stems um, for or stipes that, that and, and they're very heavily colonized usually, whereas the, the other species isn't. Anyway, this picture isn't about the kelp. The kelp is just the background. This is a photo of a crystal jellyfish. Um, and this is another photo, I think, of a different crystal jellyfish, actually. I'm not sure. Maybe it's the same one. Um, I don't remember if these are two. Maybe it's two shots of the same one. Um, just floating over the kelp. And I thought it was quite fun, the contrast between the jellyfish and the kelp in these pictures, slightly different take on a jellyfish shot. Normally you're sort of trying to get them against the surface or get them against the sun. And it was a bit of fun to shoot down one for a change. Right, now we've left Scotland. Um, I said it's a bit of a, a mixed bag this, this time in terms of destinations. And we're now down in Cornwall. This is um, the boiler of the Marguerite. The SS Marguerite shipwreck, which is this, this boiler is kind of submerged at low tide and exposed at high tide. Um, sorry, um, submerged at high tide and exposed at low tide. Um, and it sits off Talland Bay, which is near Lou in just in the on the east side of on the southeast of Cornwall. Um, and it's a nice little snorkel. And there's some very nice um, seaweed gardens around there. You can dive it as well. I've dived it before as well. I think I preferred it as a snorkel. Um, you can get around what's quite a large area more efficiently on snorkel than you can scuba diving it. Um, so this is just some spaghetti weed um, with, um, and then here, here again, you can see the zonation of the the kelp, the the, the lemon area at the bottom, then going into the, the those red um, pom poms, the serratiums, and then at the top the um, the spaghetti weed. Um, um, so, so I really like that that sort of transition. You can really see the zonation. It's something you really notice a lot when you're exploring these environments is, is how specialised the different species of seaweeds are and how they tend to very much stay in their zones. Um, and so this picture shows that, that zonation rather nicely. And now we've left Cornwall and we're over in Norfolk on the east side of England. And this is a rather unusual. These are, these are horse mackerel or scad. Um, and this is a school of them. And I, w I was diving with the EMWL1, which is not a, an ideal lens for shooting fast moving schooling fish in very low visibility. Um, but I'm glad I got some sort of record because it's not, you don't often see schooling fish in British waters as a diver. So it's always nice to get shots of, of larger schooling fish when you get the chance, even if it's not the world's greatest shot. This is a flounder, also shot with the EMWL1. So the, the, Technical information of these, the EXIF data will show 105 mil lens, but the, it's got the obviously the the EM Nauticam's EMWL1 telescope on the front of it. Just a um, another shot. This is just a, um, a a branching sponge. I think it's called something like mermaid's glove. Um, the this branching sponge because the, the shape is often this is a particularly big one, which is why I, I bothered to process a, a fairly standard ID shot. It's, it's a very very nice fan shaped one. They're usually a bit smaller than this and look a bit more like a, a glove or a mitten or or something like that on the seabed. And then this this handsome um, um, velvet swimming crab with these lovely red eyes here on the sponge. There is a fish at the top of this picture. And I'm not quite sure what it is. It's probably just a young shanny. But yeah, I can't ID that fish um, easily. Or well, certainly not without getting to the books. And then the final shot is back to Cornwall again. Um, and I just, I've just i just not done any sort of... I haven't really been through these pictures properly. I've just pulled a few out. And this final shot is an edible crab. 
quite a big male one um on the on the road on the the lookout going across the seabed i like that he's really standing up here they don't normally stand up like this and this was on a, a dusk into night dive and i think that this guy was probably right it's dark now i can get out and about he's also got a very encrusted shell this one um you see all those worm tubes all over him and that often happens when the crabs get infected by barnacle parasites which stop them shedding their shell um, and, and that's when you see them very heavily crusted, um, in, encrusted. So it might just be a very old one, but I suspect this one might have a parasite, um, which is it's actually very common in, in lots of crabs, but that's what those um, worm tubes on him show. But I really like this one. I just you know, really like his upright stand. Quite often, um, these edible crabs or brown crabs, as, as we call them um, in the UK, aren't very, they tend to be hunkered down on the seabed, not doing very much. You know, you can often use them in a composition because they, they're looking out of a hole in the reef or something like that. Um, but I like this one that he was so animated and he was on the move walking across the seabed. Um, I also I think I like the fact he's got these massive great claws. So that's just a few of the pictures I've, I've shot recently or processed recently and shot recently. Nothing super spectacular there, but hopefully it was useful and provide some information. So I, as I said, I'm off to Canada to shoot some stuff. So after that trip, I'll be have large amounts of colorful cold water photos to show if I'm lucky and manage to get a few in focus. And I look forward to, to showing those off um, once I've had the chance to process them.